Hi there, I'm Martin. I'm Helen. I'm Sean. And I'm Dave. And welcome back to the Other Worlds podcast. Uh, today we're going to do something different to what we'd, we would usually do. We're going to basically record a, our reply as writers to an op-ed that was published in the Telegraph, and at least on the Telegraph's website. Uh, the, the title of the op-ed is that no self-respecting adult should buy comics or watch superhero movies. Uh, I think it's safe to say that given the types of subject we're talking about on this vlog, given our own um, our own sort of wheelhouses when it comes to what we enjoy, what we find enjoyable, this is something we feel we need to respond to. Mm -hmm. uh, I will start off though by saying that this is an op-ed. It is not an article, it is somebody's opinion and we are responding to somebody's opinion. Uh, We'll probably get into that a bit more. What I would suggest, though, is that anybody who's watching this, we would ask that you read the uh, read the op-ed yourselves, so that you're not just going off what we say mm. they said. It's always better to read uh, an article or mm. an op-ed yourselves. Um, the sort of basic and correct me if I'm wrong, guys. The basic uh, summary of the op-ed is that superhero movies, comic books, they are for children, and adults should not be. Uh, should not be consuming them, should not be reading them, should not be watching them. Uh, how do we feel about this personally? Our own sort of knee-jerk opinions, if it was. A couple of sentences. Oh, let me. <laughs> this entire opinion piece is rubbish. Okay. As my, as my personal opinion, it's utter rubbish, and it's remarkably hypocritical and... Founded on their own personal taste. Yes, it's an opinion piece, but they are basically taking a slant against an entire, well, I say millions of people, billions mm -hmm. potentially, because of what they, their tastes are. But because it's something that is, in fairness, a bit childish, but it's their own personal taste. So it's self aggrandizing, hypocritical rubbish. Okay. And that's where I'll leave it at. So you feel quite strongly at <laughs> Yeah, you know, I'm still a annoyed. For the first time ever, and this is going to come as a surprise to the people whose company I'm in, I'm going to take a centrist position <laughs> on oh this. Oh my word. Uh, especially since you know my, my personal gripes of the publication in question. But <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's, it's ultimate argument is true, it is childish, it is mm -hmm. silly, it is a daft thing to do, but I think he's rather <laughs> missed the point. That that doesn't really matter. That's not an mm. argument. Mm. That's like saying, "Oh, um, sweets are for children. Chocolate is for children." So, yeah, but that is it's uh, that is the prime audience for that particular um, consumerist item. I'm I'm just pulling words out my hat here, but. Um, what happened? I quite I quite enjoy chocolate. It has to be said. So I, I think I think I think he's rather missed the point. Mm. I don't think he's really <clears throat> in his reading into it. Okay. But I'm sure we're going to talk about that. Mm. Similar thing, really. I think he's decided to use this as a platform to again air his own views, mm -hmm. but he's not taking into consideration that yeah, people are going to be reading this and responding to it, and that they might take a bit of insult at it because he's. While he's not overly aggressive in his language at all, he is he's painting everyone with a very with the same brush and he's he's not trying to look into the reasons why people might see a bigger value in it than what he does. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of just yes, I, oh, my my opinion is the is the right one in a way because he's not even looked at anyone else's side of things. He's not presented a counter argument for himself, which is, I suppose, why it's an op-ed rather than an article. Yeah, if it, was, yeah. if it was an article, we'd have a much bigger problem. I, th oh, yeah. God, I, yes. I, I, I think that, that's fair to say. If, it, if this were an article, um, mm. then I think we would all be responding to it far in a far more strong way than perhaps we are. Not we to say that we are not going to respond yeah. to this quite strongly. You three would. Well, well, <laughs> I'm already we shall, ticked off. We shall move on to this. Yeah. I mean, f for myself, um, my concern lies less with somebody else having this opinion. Fair enough, if you want to have this opinion, have this opinion, that's, that's your prerogative. What I get concerned about is that, especially with the likes of Facebook, um, especially with social media these days, people will see headlines. You know, a title like this is just provocative. No self-respecting mm. should buy comics or watch superhero yeah. movies. That right there, seeing that come from a news outlet, I think 
having seen what uh, what my friends and, and what my acquaintances on Facebook share, I do worry that people have, have lost the distinction between what an op-ed is and what an article is. Mm. Mm. Um, that has been particularly eroded, and I do feel that that's something that, that, that that's part of the reason I wanted to address this, and I think yeah. um, it is important. These are our opinions, though. Yeah. Let's move on, though. Everyone is entitled to my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody is entitled wow. to their own opinions yeah. as well. But I think it's important for us as well, though, to consider the fact we are writers. We are people who trained as writers at university level. And when you train at university, one of the things that is being done at university is to prepare you for employment. Mm. Now, if you want to write screenplays, you kind of you may not enjoy soaps, but you kind of need to understand how the soap opera works. Mm. Yeah. You may not you may not enjoy something, for example, like Fifty Shades of Grey. However, it's important to understand why it was so popular. Unless of as course writer. your tutors give you the first three pages in class and say this is how you don't do it. Uh, th this is true. <laughs> I actually, I also don't get why it's popular. Well, uh, this is I mean this is something that I don't I don't necessarily understand, but. For, for us looking at what works, mm. we kind of, you know, I, I, I was saying this before we were recording, uh, I was saying this to Sean before we started, that uh, I happen to understand why Pride and Prejudice is a masterpiece. Yeah. I don't necessarily agree that it's terribly well written, I find it kind of dry. I think the relationships are great, the characters are well drawn. There's, la there's a lack of description, there's a lack of anything that draws me into that book. Mm. We all have our own opinions on these mm. things. As writers, though, we do, do you, would you agree to, I mean, it's my response to it, but would you agree that it's important that we at least look at why superhero movies, why comic books are, are and have become so popular? Yeah, there's a, val there's a valid point in the piece where he rather erroneously compares it to, and um, he's getting a dumb burger. Mm -hmm. And that's fine, but if your favourite restaurants, Italian, whatever, are closed down to make way for that and there are only burger joints, then that's a problem. And he's absolutely right at that point, and I can understand why somebody who isn't particularly enamoured of, <laughs> to, to put it lightly, of a particular culture, I can understand why you would be a bit peeved of the, the influx, the floodgates opened mm -hmm. of this one particular I can, I can understand why that would be overwhelming. Variety is the spice life, and we want variety in, in our cultures. But when it comes down to it, it's a case of, well, if you don't like it, no one is making you. Well, the thing, but yeah. then again, at the same time, I can see where he's coming from, because there are a hell of a lot of them. Well, there are, but this is the thing. Flipping the, the idea on it, personally, I'm not a big fan of sport, but I would argue that sport is more everywhere. It takes over, not just the movie theatre, it takes over everything mm. when there's a big football tournament on. What if you don't like football? You We're sport? recording from Merseyside, incidentally. You can, you can imagine how this... <laughs> it's it's ra yeah. It would be a rather unpopular uh, point yeah. of view. Well, that's I why like we're hiding ball. here. Yeah. I like but football, in the bunker. but not that much. <laughs> well, well, it's everywhere, well, year if, round. If, okay, okay. if Marx was writing today, he'd be saying that Premiership football is the opiates of the masters. <laughs> And in 20 years' yeah. time, you'll be saying that superhero movies are the opiates of a master. You, you, I mean, in fairness, you have had attempts to understand something like football, for example, by theatre practitioners like Brecht, yes. who argued that, that football is, in fact, theatre. There is a story being told there, and if you watch the news, you can understand that. Your favourite, or somebody's favourite footballer, goes through a journey. There is a journey that is portrayed through the media, through the, you know, there is the mm. golden boy in Wayne Rooney. You watch his, his story is unraveled uh, in the early 2000s, it's comparable to uh, the story that would unfurl on something like The X Factor. Hmm. Again, not necessarily something yeah, right, that right, right, enjoys. Right, right, I, I am being able to hypocritical myself, but here's the thing, I don't think nobody should watch those. I don't judge somebody on their we adulthood. Based on what they want. We as writers sorry, would like I'm to apologise for the hideous it. double negative that Dave the writer just used. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We encourage you to check your grammar and your syntax at all times. <laughs> or get a spell check a friend. Right. You're yeah, you're absolutely, you're, no, you're absolutely right. It's, yeah, no, my double negatives. How dare I speak colloquially? Yeah. It's, the same, it's the same principle, yeah. but it's, uh, it's an emerging culture. It's a change in yeah. the culture, and as writers, um, we have to have an ear 
to the changing culture, especially if, because let's face it, it's not a pleasant thing to admit, because when we all started, I think we all had this kind of quasi-bohemian idea of, I'm going to write great masterpieces and I will be a genius in my time, but as you get to the point where you're actually looking to make a little bit of cash out of it, maybe writing op-eds for the Daily Telegraph, <laughs> not plugging my CV at all, <laughs> you, you do have to have an ear to what is popular so that you can break in. You can't do what you want to do immediately. So having an ear to the changing culture is necessary. It is well, yes. Maybe it's worth actually talking about that in and of itself. Um, Especially websites and what perhaps might be seen as new media news outlets. Hmm. Uh, so I'm thinking of something like the Huffington Post here, which perhaps is not the most reputable news source. Um, that's not that. That's a generalisation, and I apologise for that. But the uh, you look at BuzzFeed, you look at a lot of these other new media news outlets or, or uh, opinion piece outlets. Hmm. The way they construct their headlines, th this term of clickbait, mm. uh, as a writer, it's a very astute thing to understand that process. And certainly, you know, this, uh, this, this op-ed has done its job in just that title alone, got me clicking and going, hang on, there's something yeah. here that I can now use to base something else off. In, yeah. in, in this case, this, this podcast. Um, Perhaps that's worth talking mm. about as well. Is the mm. way that the way that these things have changed? I don't think about it. It's just occurred to me, but there does seem to be a very interesting disconnect emerging. That on the one side you have a culture that is obsessed with brevity, that um, will only read the headline as far, far as we just scroll through the news feed and tries to condense the myriad of human thought down to 140 characters. Steadily <laughs> follow me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> shameless plugs, shameless plugs. I'm, I'm unemployed and There will be artists. time for no, that no, at the end, anyway, don't worry. So on the one hand, you've got those who are absolutely obsessed with brevity. But then on the other side, and it's the culture that is under attack here, is in-depth, analytical, and obsessive. And there's nothing, I don't mean that in a bad way in any sense, but there is nothing, <coughs> excuse me, there's nothing brief about understanding a fandom. A book series, a comic series, a film series, no. it takes time, it takes effort. You go to you a convention, you go to comic con, they, the, there is effort, there is time and money invested. Mm. So on the one hand, there's people who want it immediately. Mm. In that respect, these are the ones who want fast food. Yeah. We're the ones in the kitchen slaving over a five-course yeah. meal. <laughs> We're the ones really putting in the effort. Yeah, see, I want my roast dinner, I want my chicken, I want and, my and potatoes, I want perfectly. my peas, these carrots, are, and so on. Yeah, these, are, these, are, these are the people who just um, grab a burger and half a bottle of Lucas like this. <laughs> so so it, 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 it's, inter it's interesting the gulf in thinking <laughs> that is emerging um, <clears throat> in news outlets. Because uh, they say clickbait. Uh, absolutely right, but how many people actually click it? Or do they just read the headline? Do they just go by the tweet? Uh, I, I must eyes. admit, that is something I find myself wondering, is how many people are actually reading this, especially when you see um, uh, there was a dreadful, uh, dreadfully portrayed news article, and it was actually a news article, uh, as published by the Liverpool Echo. And obviously I, I act as well as write, and you know, theatre and drama is one of the things I, I am quite active in, and it was over a casting call hmm. on a fourth-rate casting network for Morrison's. At the oh, end of, yes. uh, uh, I remember. At the end I of remember. which, this article said they didn't want anybody who spoke posh, but they also didn't want anybody from Liverpool. Now, interestingly, in the Echo article, a whole sentence had been given to a quote by Morrison saying that they had not authorised this casting call. Yeah. Which means someone somewhere in the chain screwed up. That's quite clear. Mm. Whether that be the new, you know, maybe it was a new PR firm that they hired and that person was inexperienced in writing casting calls. Maybe it was just a scam casting call. It's 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 entirely possible and it does happen on these websites. It shouldn't, mm. but it sadly it does. Um, and then yet the number of people who are commenting on the likes of Facebook uh, and, and even Twitter about how terrible it was and how they, how all these, all these scousers were coming out saying that they were going to uh, boycott Morrison's. Mm. Well, you know, and, and comparing it to the Sun in the way that they, um, the way that they have treated Liverpool. 
that's an interesting study on just how people react to just the headlines alone. Mm. Uh, what really interested me is, despite the number of times Morrison's have come out and said, it, well, you know, we well, did not authorise this, <laughs> uh, the person who on Twitter and Facebook called, uh, the page is called Scousebird Problems, has not removed the link, nor has this person acknowledged Morrison's side of the story. If that were a traditional news outlet, that would be quite remiss. Mm. Um, but you can get away with it on social media and new media news outlets because people don't have the same expectations, perhaps. Mm. Uh, that, that's just speculation rather than anything else. And also, to a certain extent, it could, it could just be anyone who's writing these things. There's, there's no, like In the industry before, you had to actually already be in the industry and be established before anyone... You can actually get to that level of publishing. Whereas now, anyone can sit down at a computer, rattle up an article or op-ed or whatever it is, or a tweet even, put it out to the, into, the, into the open, and then they, they're not really held accountable because who are they? You know. Well, I mean, the very fact that we can sit here and, and record podcasts like these shows just how much the industries have changed. Uh, you know, I don't think there would necessarily have been a platform for us to sit down and talk about the types of subjects that we're talking mm. about uh, ten years ago. Certainly not outside of the pub. Mm. <laughs> this is entirely true. And perhaps this is this leads us to an idea, to an idea of why these things have, be, have been seen as more popular, perhaps. Mm. Mm. Um, I, I could be wrong on that. Uh, I mean, it might be interesting to pivot to something else that might be considered childish, but certainly by no means is an example of poor writing, and that is Disney. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Disney, Pixar, the, the, the movies and, and the works of those two companies in particular, if you look at them, uh, they, there is no doubt in my mind that they are very well written. Well, for adults, yeah. for children, there is an enjoyability well, factor on, the, on <clears> both sides. And the actual truth behind them, I think, I've come across this term repeatedly when it comes to Disney movies. They're not kids' films, they're family films. Yes. And unfortunately they are, again, it's the same similar situation with superhero movies. They're deemed as kid stuff. Mm. But they had to make those movies, um, Disney movies to specify, um, with enough humour for the mums and dads or the elder viewers to be able to enjoy them. Because otherwise they weren't going to get as much money is what it comes mm. down to in the end and but it's still viewed as a kid thing I mean for for a couple of years I, I must admit I was rather fortunate I was never looked down on for enjoying Disney films by my family so I could watch them all I wanted at home but I didn't tell people I was watching Disney films like my friends and stuff mm -hmm. but now I would quite happily sit down and watch a Disney film and tell you all about how awesome it was it's the old, <laughs> it's, it's the old notion that is in its death rows of um but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Mm. That doesn't seem to hold true. We are clinging on. Well, not even clinging on. We're just retaining. We're, we don't feel obliged to put away the things that we enjoyed as children that we still enjoy now. Mm. I mean, the same goes with computer games. Oh, yeah. Uh, computer games have developed so far because they are being uh, created now. By people who played them as children, said, "Well, I don't want to stop this," yeah. and they are making them for. <laughs> Same goes for animation. Um, Adult Swim um, has is, is primarily staffed by people who were watching Cartoon Network when we were. Tops. But, but you can argue that that's been the case since the days of The Simpsons. Absolutely. Oh well, yeah. Um, y there is a fair argument uh, that there will be some who considered The Simpsons when it first aired as an adult cartoon. Hmm. hmm. Uh, it perhaps was never designed that way, but I, I can remember people uh, when I was younger not necessarily wanting me to watch The Simpsons because they thought it was a bit crass, it was not really for children. And that's a fair comment when you consider some of the subjects yeah. that they touch. Mm. Nevertheless, it's still rather well written. Oh, yeah. Um, but, I mean, going back to what Sean said about um, we're kind of growing out of the whole putting away childish things. Yeah, as we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't feel obliged to, to stop enjoying things. Yeah. That actually is mentioned quite explicitly, really, in this op ed where mm -hmm. the writer says that uh, when he was 14, his dad was the reason he put away, mm. or is one of the main reasons why he put away these comics, because his dad was un under the impression that uh, one chip puberty comics and all those charged things were put away and he started reading I believe he quoted um, the author John Updike or something mm -hmm. um, and he said that you would read that until until you liked it mm -hmm. 
so to <laughs> me it seems like the author is, of, of the op-ed is under the impression that or is, is kind of following what his father thinks and what his father's generation perhaps thinks yeah. rather whereas most of our generation now I don't know how old the, the author is to be fair but most of our generation now is more going against the tide we're kind of not really regarding the morals and you know the things we, what our parents used, used to do like our, our parents generation would perhaps say okay yeah we're getting a bit old for that now time to put it away Whereas now we just go, well, actually, no, we're still enjoying this. I mean, there is, I mean, off the back of that, there is a statement, there is a, a an argument to be made that society has certainly become more liberal, has certainly become more accepting uh, in, from ev- in, in everything, from the way we dress to the, the expectation that we should respect everybody's points of view. There was... Um, you know, there is an interesting picture, and I'm, I've got the article here on the on the tablet in front of me. And there's an interesting picture of a woman who's wearing a Captain America shield bag. Yeah. Um, and I'll be honest, and perhaps this is judgmental of me, I do remember seeing somebody in a business suit on the train on the way to Liverpool with a Legend of Zelda Link shield bag. That's pretty thinking, cool. That is that awesome. <laughs> But for my part, I'm coming at that as somebody who used to go into an office environment as a self-employed person and going, how do you expect somebody in a business environment to take you seriously? I'm presuming that the suit means you're heading into work. And part of me still goes, uh, still thinks along the lines of, how do you expect people in a professional setting to take you seriously? Now, I may Except be... It's not going to be very long until it's us who are the... Masters of a professional setting, mm. and in that point, if you well, we've just explained that both me and Sean were go, that's pretty cool. If you walked in with a Zelda bag, I mean, here's the thing: it's it's again pointing at the previous generation, and I I do sort of agree with you. If you're going, depending on where you're working and what the dynamic is like in your office, maybe that should have been left at home. Mm. But if he's in an office dynamic where his boss, or if he is the boss, and he doesn't mind, fair enough. Because mm. again, if you are Judging professionalism on appearance, I would never get hired again. Because mm. I don't iron my clothes and I'm scruffy. And that would be wrong. Well, yeah, yeah if you were a QC. Job. Well, well yeah. yeah. But if I walked in the QC like this and <laughs> unshaved and just <laughs> like I got showered for a week. There yeah, is, there is still an position, aspect, though. though of companies, and especially the more corporate style companies, having a corporate image. Mm. And, the, and whether or not we like that, whether or not people agree with that, corporate image is something that uh, companies do want to maintain. Yeah. Well, look at Pixar's corporate image. That positively thrives under... Well, it's called the same goes for Google. Well, yeah, by, well. By, by legend and reputation. Yeah. Anyway, it, it could be a hovel for all I know. Personally, or, I've never been. No. Well, there are certainly there are certainly office environments that are for, far more relaxed mm. than that. I mean, I, I I used to be self-employed, do, you know, doing IT support stuff. You know, the computer was broken. It was a small company that didn't mm. have you know didn't have anybody to go in and repair. They'd bring me in, or if if uh, they needed a website designing, I would go in. And I went into offices where jeans and t-shirts were the norm. And I went into offices mm. where you weren't uh, you know you had to be wearing your suit jacket, and you weren't even allowed to put your suit jacket over your chair. Because because that was not acceptable. It's also, I'm sorry, sorry, I'm trying to not do opinion opinions. But 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 it's daft. Sorry. <laughs> to me, I must admit, it seemed odd in a, on a summer's day to go into an office where there were no coat racks, so you couldn't exactly hang your suit jacket yeah. up. Mm. Um, but by the same token, I can appreciate that that's part of their corporate image. That's part of sweaty stuff. The. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. Is, is that Gandalf's secret video? <laughs> <laughs> Corpor- I'm sorry, Martin. Corporate image is just that, though. It is about the image. You know, you go into certain food chains and it is not acceptable for people to have tattoos down, down their arms. Tattoos must be able to be hidden. There are certain chains you will go into where it's not acceptable to have your hair uh, a shade of pink or in a... In a, a a wonderful hairstyle. There are plenty of places where facial hair is and is not allowed as part of a uniform. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, hygienically speaking, that does make a most yeah, sense. I can, I can it understand must, that. It, must, it must be said that does make a, a, yeah. t- a touch of sense. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and I can understand that that sort of I can understand that side of the of, of the opinion here that there are things that aren't necessarily 
that, that, that still maybe we're not as liberal as a society. Mm. We're not as accepting as a society on. No. Just to tie together three threads of conversations that are going on here, um, to broaden it up just slightly away from uh, superheroes in general and to the wider nerd, geeky community yeah. that's um, to open up a fantasy, sci fi, comics, everything. And uh, Dave's point on the generational thing, I'm not entirely sure it is a generational thing. I'd like to know where it comes from. Because there are so many people of our parents and even grandparents generation that is fully embracing this mm. I mean I was introduced to Batman by my mother mm. uh, and that never stopped we said uh, my you have you've, you've both, you've both met my uncle uh, his, <laughs> yeah. has got the um, <laughs> the Black Speech of Mordor tattooed around him and his comic collection is fantastic and he's a very respected engineer. But here's the thing, when it comes to corporate images and particular jobs, my family's background, the jobs they've worked in, where these people have introduced their children and kept introducing them even when they're in their twenties to fantasy, sci-fi, comics and these films, are from the sciences. Mm -hmm. Um, medicine, biomolecular, engineering, mathematics. So is there a particular branch of career where it is acceptable? Because the big tech companies like Google and Pixar, they uh, they embrace this massively. So, well, yeah. uh, I mean, on that point, that's somewhere where you can start talking about. Uh, sorry to interrupt. No. But, uh, that, that, that's somewhere where you can start talking about STEM versus STEAM. This idea that science, technology, engineering, and maths cannot exist without arts and mm. creativity. Yeah. You know, certainly Apple would never. The, the Apple's products, the big selling point of those, there were MP3s before the iPod. Mm. Yeah. But what? distinguished the iPod was a sense of creative design those that you know that device was designed in such a way it was easy to use it was designed mm. in such a way that it looked attractive to hold it was as much an art piece a, a creative piece as it was a technological piece I still have a classic iPod <clears throat> I make a point of buying it but uh, so there, there is an argument to be made there. Hmm. Well, that's, actually, that's a really interesting point. Uh, that's a Bacoint. really interesting point because there the, yeah, there we are. Um, <laughs> the culture that we're talking about and that is being uh, lampooned in the op-ed is the combination of science and art. Um, these films require new technologies to be developed so that they can portray something artistically. And going as far back as H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, these most of the things they predict, predicted or at least invented in their science fiction stories have now come to be. Yeah, their ideas have been so, manifest by scientists. Yeah, in this creative mix, which is now a pertinent part of our everyday culture, is the blend of steam. Yeah, but I think you have to look at there's a brilliant point made by Adam Savage, I think his name is from Mythbusters he writes an article about um, the importance of arts and culture within the STEM subjects because mm -hmm. if you do not allow your children to do art and music and any creative form, where are they going to get the creativity from to come up with our new mm -hmm. technology? Because mm -hmm. a lot of our, as we've just said, a lot of our um, big science breakthrough, breakthroughs in technology have come through Science fiction. Mm. Not all of it, of course, but a good <coughs> chunk of it. Well, I mean, it's interesting to me you pick up Adam Savage because uh, Adam Savage is one of those people I I truly admire as far mm. as uh, what he does out there and is certainly in, in the way he talks about things. What, to me, is telling is that this is a man who started off uh, as a... He started off in, in the world of theatre, I believe. I could be wrong on that, so <coughs> if I am, I apologise. But, uh, you know, he was a model maker. As well, and you look at him now as certainly on Tested, which is a big inspiration of mine. Uh, he's using engineering skills in a creative way. Mm. And <clears throat> anytime he talk, you know, anytime I've seen him talk about MythBusters and how he how they created uh, an episode of MythBusters, they were always asking themselves what the story was behind the myth. Mm -hmm. Where was this story going? How does that story develop? What is the story you want to tell? And that to me is an interesting thing because we do need yeah, yeah. we do need an understanding of that whatever we're talking about if you're delivering a presentation if I'm delivering a presentation for a, for a website or a pitch if I'm trying to pitch for a, for an IT job mm. uh, then I need to be able to a beginning middle of an e and end I need to tell the story of why I am the better person for that job yeah yeah see it's, it, to go back centuries a lot long before the invention of anything we're talking about here the great turning point in European art 
was when artists started training in mathematics. Hmm. Where we started to understand um, how dimensions work and perspective. Yeah. I mean, apparently, the, I, this could be apocryphal, but apparently the fellow who commissioned The Last Supper by uh, Da Vinci it fainted when he saw it. Mm. Because he'd never seen anything like it, the mm. way it was compared, it, it's faded beyond its former glory now. Yeah. But when science and art are blended, and maybe that's painting the wall of a monk's lunchroom, or if it's making, inventing new technologies to make a fantastical story on the screen, this is a very important blend. And maybe now that we live in the information age and we can access art through technology so much more quickly than we ever could. I know YouTube's in a bit of a weird place right now and it'll mm. sort of stuff out. But nevertheless you can access these things so quickly. Mm. Maybe we're a little overawed, maybe we're a little swamped by this sudden influx, but ultimately this is a really, really good thing. This is something to be embraced because this is kind of what we've been going for as a species for yeah. so long. Well, I mean let's let's sort of move on a bit then, because you mentioned H. G. Wells mm. and Jules Verne, and writers have been writing speculative fiction for almost as long as they've been writing fiction, I would argue. Yeah. yeah. Whether it be the mythological stories, how we come to be, or what have you, uh, right through to you know, H. G. Wells, yeah. right through now even to those who are writing comic books. Yeah. yeah. Is it fair for us as writers to look at that and, and argue, perhaps, or suggest, perhaps, that there are things that speculative fiction, that uh, sci-fi, that fantasy, that alternate history even, there are subjects that these genres can, can touch and talk about that general fiction just can't. Yeah, I would agree entirely, but there are just there are just topics that are better covered by the speculative fiction genre. That doesn't mean that there can't be good, co good covering of those subjects in... Uh, literary fiction, but there are just certain things which lend, lend themselves to, especially when it comes to allegories or metaphors, or telling a story in a different way to make you think about it differently, because one of the big things that I really think of recently especially, is if we're including supposed kid stuff, Zootopia, or Zootropolis whatever it's mm -hmm. called, has been pointed out as possible racism connotations of, like, pointing out the examples of it in our society mm -hmm. in a way that can be explained without basically pointing the finger at people saying you're racist. Mm -hmm. It's also a good way to and also through that District to, 9. Of, um, well, yes, apartheid. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But it's also I went to see Zootopolis or Zootopia whatever it's yeah. called in the UK at the minute mm. um, the other day and you're on the money there with it being mm. there's lots of allegories and examples really because there's one scene where one of the main characters is patting the wall on the top of a sheep's head, and the other characters can't swat the time. You can't just pat a sheep's wool, yeah. which is very similar to the way that a lot of people will just, without asking, without permission, will just reach out to someone's hair, or particularly mm. in this case, often a black person's hair, and just because they don't they want to. It feels like that. Actually I'm getting me yeah. you've never seen it. It does happen. Yeah. Fair enough. But it's it's. But you have a thing. I, I, just, yeah. I suppose sorry, it's that interrupt. same thing of wanting to. Uh, there are people who want to touch a pregnant person's belly for yeah. whatever reason that might be. It's, it's still an invasion of privacy. But yeah. A fat man's gut. You will not believe how often that happens. I have to remind them I'm not popping fresh. I don't. Care. <laughs> I, can I make a slightly contentious point? Go on. Please do. These uh, these stories are the latter day parables. Mm. Yeah, I think events, you and I have spoken about it in, in great detail of how comic books, if we're going full circle, are kind of similar to America's version of the Arthurian myth. Well, certainly, uh, uh, in, in it, certain it's got, it's got uh, even, even Olympian, um, Grecian yeah. and <clears throat> Roman mythology, uh, and the people who started writing them never denied otherwise. Mm. It is part of a, uh, there is a mythic quality to them, but what I mean by parables is there is an allegorical and philosophical element to it. A mm. decent science fiction story, a decent story featuring superhumans will look at the connotations of it. Mm. What does it mean? It will analyse a particular idea and what do you get from it. This is probably how we can tell the difference between a good one and a bad one. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I haven't seen it yet, but the Batman v Superman. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and... Not seen it yet. I'm going to go ahead and guess that it doesn't really raise any of the social or philosophical or v very deeply human questions that, say, the Nolan Batman movies did. 
It's like, what well, is duty? What is revenge? What does... Is it, it's, it's a weird voice, apparently. Apparently. <laughs> yeah. but, but no, it, it's... So, I, so, I know what you mean, yeah. though. Yeah, sometimes those little scenes between um, when Christian Bale and Michael Caine, between Bruce and Alfred, sometimes yeah. you, know, you could, in a rather cynical, vulgar way, compare them to a Socratic dialogue. You really could, especially because, especially as uh, Michael Caine's Alfred seemed to have a speech ready nearly every time he turned to him. But, exactly. But, it, it's, um, it's quite yeah. preachy, and he does fill that stock character, but it's to use fantastical elements to explore... Uh, everyday issues. I, I think personally, I think Teddy Pratchett was the master of that. Mm. Oh, mm. I would, I would was, certainly agree with that. Ev- every single book that was a, whether it was something huge like the nature of belief in a chaotic universe or something really small like the independence of the small press. He, <laughs> yeah. he with this, what he built a world in which he could examine yeah. anything um, he wanted. Anything he wanted. Douglas Adams did roughly the same thing, although contentious point. I think Pratchett did it better. <laughs> No, love Douglas Adams, but I, mean, I, think, I think Pratchett did it better. Pratchett is one of those subjects we do intend to get round to. And we will <laughs> he, he, he warrants a full yeah. episode. Oh god, yeah. But it's also uh, more than more, more than, than one. Yeah, actually, well, we, we, is, we, is we, what's planned. Well, let's let let's, let's, in let's in not do a book by book. No, here all no. Day. For, for now though, we are running short on time, oh, right. so um, I think it's worth us wrapping up a little. Yes. Uh, I think it's fair to say we've all got our own responses to this op-ed, but as writers. I think we do have that unique perspective that it is important for us at least to understand Mm -hmm. why this is so popular and I think we would you know we've come to a point where we've argued that there is some there is at least literary merit in uh, the works that that we're trying to talk about the work mm. yeah. that we're discussing. Yeah, so we'll cut it there. We'll we'll end for today. Uh, but thanks, guys, for watching. Thanks for listening. If you have been, if you've got any uh, questions, if you want us to continue this, or if you want to leave any comments, please do. Uh, you can also email podcast at uh, the uh, twfproductions.co.uk, and of course, uh, there's comment section on our website so please do check that out for now though i've been martin i've been Helen. i will be sean and i have been dave <laughs> thanks Bye.